Hi, so um, my, uh, I've already been introduced and some of the uh, concepts that I'm going to talk about have also been introduced, so that's great, saves me some time. But I just wanted to say something about my background briefly. Um, I am now a neuroscientist-ish, but actually my, when I first started my research, uh, I started working on artificial intelligence and specifically on the Turing test, which is um, basically how do we know when we've got artificial intelligence? And it's been discussed uh, for over 60 years now. And um, my, my first work was on human computer conversations. And then it seemed like I started a PhD in cognitive science, got really excited by the brain. I was a little daunted by uh, the AI uh, endeavor because it felt like we didn't understand how humans did these things. So, uh, and once I started studying humans, I got kind of stuck there. And I didn't really envision going back to the AI. I, I did my PhD on uh, perception of body movements, um, similar to the work that Emily described. But in the last few years, in a very satisfying way, where I can pretend that I planned this all along, this work has come together. So, uh, and you'll see a little bit of that here. So understanding other people or other entities is uh, both very commonplace and it's very important for, for all animals. And uh, again, as Emily talked about this though, there have been some very significant changes in, in um, what, that, what that means. Specifically, our social milieu, like the, the way that we interact with each other has changed significantly. Uh, other people's bodies have changed significantly, whether that is robots or people using avatars. And ourselves, we are changing also uh, through the use of, of body augmentation and using avatars and so on. Now, if we consider, um, robotics has many, many, many goals, um, as Eric mentioned at the beginning. If we consider the task of creating a robot that is a friend, and since I'm not very mature, the example I chose, most people probably here aren't familiar, uh, or maybe you are, there are some laughter. Okay, so this is a, the cartoon, and in this cartoon, this little boy is so excited, so happy, that he has a robot friend, and of course the robot friend is actually one of the other kids. But uh, let's just try to consider this goal of having a robot friend. He's metal and small and doesn't judge me at all. He's compute, computing his way to my heart. And you're so lucky that I, my sound didn't work because then that song would get stuck in your head all day. <laughs> it happens to me all the time. So let's make friend robots, right? Social robots that we can emote and we can empathize with. On the one hand, how hard can it be? People have been making things in their image for millennia. So we have dolls, we have puppets, we have statues. It's just, you know, a technologically advanced version of that. And also, our brains make it easier for us to ascribe intentionality, socialness, facehood, to a number of inanimate objects, such as these um, examples of um, non-face objects that very easily to most of us look like faces, or these movie uh, little uh, triangles and circles interacting. That's just a bunch of lines and shapes, really, but once you see it move, uh, most people perceive some kind of social s situation in those uh, images. So on the one hand, because this is such an important domain, our brains are able to give us a lot of information and uh, we almost are socially oriented by default. So these are things working for us in, um, in developing robot friend. So why is it hard? Because it is hard. And it's hard even though um, advances in technology mean now, as both the speakers mentioned, that we have better sensors than ever and they'll keep getting better. Computation is faster than ever, it'll keep getting faster. Everything can happen in the cloud and faster and in real time. So all of these um, technologies are coming together, both in terms of the hardware and the software, and yet it remains hard to develop a robot that really people like. And uh, I generally want to make the point, and this is a really obvious point, however it can very often be lost, is that people are who decide what's intelligent. People are the ones who decide what's conscious, what has agency, what has feelings. And people are the ones who decide whether somebody is your friend or not. So do we understand how people do these things? And so here is what, where I feel like 
we need to use uh, both neuroscience and social psychology and cognitive sciences more broadly uh, to understand what people are doing when they choose a human friend versus a robot friend. Okay, so a little more about my research now stepping into a special case of, of uh, social cognition um, is action, the, the domain of action perception. And since Emily did such a great job as, of introducing these concepts, I'm gonna go over it a little faster. So we know in the brain that this cartoon is, um, I don't wanna necessarily get too much into you know, specific brain areas, but both visual areas in the back of the brain, which is the yellow, my um, thing doesn't work, uh, visual areas in the back of the brain are involved in perceiving visual actions, but also motor areas are also involved in this uh, because of uh, the idea that we simulate uh, what we see in our own motor system. And the, interestingly, the visual areas in the back and motor areas in the front are connected through parietal lobe and not directly connected. The way that I usually put this is if you want to go from San Diego where I live to San Francisco where you guys are close, uh, on the train, you have to go through Bakersfield. You don't have a direct line. So parietal cortex here is your Bakersfield. <laughs> it's a really important area, you guys. <laughs> All right, so this is about 10 years of my life in one slide. Usually I work with stimuli that aren't as exciting as robots, simplified representations of body movements, such as these point light displays, which are basically motion capture stimuli, but they've been used in uh, vision science for a very long time. And what we found is that even with these very basic animations, your brain's uh, motor system is involved in, uh, in perceiving them. Now, I love working with these stimuli because they're highly controllable, but at some point I had to face the fact that people don't come in point lights. Um, so we have to also understand how the appearance of the agents affects things. And in particular, um, we're talking here today about artificial agents and specifically humanoid robots. Humanoid robots, they can perform recognizable actions, right? And their appearance can be more or less human-like. And uh, most of them, as Emily also mentioned, uh, do not have tr biological motion dynamics, the dynamics of, of living entities' movements, although this is very rapidly changing. Um, so what we saw in these humanoid robots when I started this work now quite a long time ago, it was an opportunity to test the sensitivity of the brain systems that we were studying for action perception for human movement on one hand and human appearance on the other hand. And of course, also this is relevant to robot design because um, what we learn from the brain data can tell us more about what kinds of robots we should make. So one idea would be, again, the like me hypothesis that Emily mentioned is if you have a, an agent that looks more like you, the neural systems that have uh, the, this uh, motor simulation will have an easier time uh, sort of accepting that other entity on, into your own brain. Uh, perhaps you will have increased empathy. Perhaps you will have uh, increased engagement. So it seems like one solution to what kinds of robots should we make for the social robots or my robot friend goal, just make them more human-like. Uh, and however, previous work on this is quite uh, limited and also um, inconsistent. Some studies sh uh, argue that, you know, Robots do not engage the mirror neuron system. Others say they do, uh, they do, um, but that, I'll show you that, and also Emily has shown you that. We wanted to do, um, what we wanted to do that to address some of the shortcomings in previous work was to use state-of-the-art robots um, developed by actual roboticist uh, Hiroshi Shiguro, and this is one of his androids that looks very much like him. So he makes these really lifelike robots, which was an opportunity to sort of test what's going on in the brain, even when you have a robot that looks very much like a human being. And uh, we manipulated both the form and the motion of the robots in our experiments. Now, one thing that happens, as I mentioned, uh, one idea would be to make the robots increasingly, just make it more human-like. And the reason that doesn't work is uh, exemplified by this Uncanny Valley hypothesis. It's not really set in stone. Uh, that this is what it looks like. But the basic idea is that if you have on the x-axis human likeness of, a, of an agent, robot in this case, but could be an avatar, and on the y-axis you have the human reaction, increased human likeness leads to an increased acceptance 
uh, up to a certain point where increased human likeness tends to have the opposite effect and then on the other end you have a real human where once again it's okay. But in between in this region is the uncanny valley where the agents appear zombie-like or uh, disgusting or disturbing or eerie and so on. So this looks all nice and like data-like, but it's actually most, most uh, a summary of the hypothesis. The data on it is, is quite mixed. But the main idea that I want to bring up is that the relationship between human response to robots isn't linear. Uh, it's not simply that you make them more robotic and they become better responded to. Uh, in our studies, we wanted to look at whether mechanisms for body movement and action processing were adapted specifically to our conspecifics or whether uh, they would also be generalized to uh, robots. And I think I'm going to go a little fast here because um, Emily also mentioned similar things. The android that we worked with is uh, the one that you see in the video. And she has a human model that looks very similar to her. And you'll see in just a second. So we took the opportunity to work with both. And uh, she can make upper body and facial movements. And that's the real human. And that's her. And if you notice, actually, her body movements, her arm movements are quite jerky and um, non-human-like, uh, mechanical. Uh, but the, uh, the design of the face and uh, so on is quite impressive. So we, I'm, I'm a kind of a vision science nerd, so it's really important for us to control the stimulus properties as much as possible, especially with neuroimaging, because you know, any difference between the stimuli can lead to evoked activity. So these two are very similar in their appearance. And, but I wanted to also have a robot-looking robot. But then all the other robot-looking robots were different sizes and so on. So what we did was we undressed this robot that they had so carefully made to look like a human to make it look back like a robot again. And you know, through a series of uh, alterations, we managed to cover the skin and so on. The, the, net, the main goal for this was to have the kinematics of these movements be identical but the appearance to vary. And so at first sight, when you see this agent, your brain is going to be able to tell from the wires and the metal and so on that that's not really a person. Whereas at first sight, this can appear to be a person. So our database that we use in, in these studies consists of these actions performed by these three agents, uh, same background and color and so on. Uh, the robot and the android, I'm going to call them robot and android even though they're actually the same machine. The robot and the android share motion because uh, they are doing the exact same thing, but they differ in their uh, appearance. One of them is mechanical, the other is human-like. And the android and the human are the opposite. They share appearance, very similar in appearance, not identical, but they differ in their movement. So in this scenario, the robot and the human are the furthest away from each other. They're different in both appearance and movement. But in one sense, they're similar in that this one looks like a mechanical machine, moves like a machine. This one looks like a person, moves like a person. This one looks like a person, moves like a machine. So there's the third possibility that the brain is, there's three possibilities. Brain could be sensitive to form, brain could be sensitive to motion, or the brain could be sensitive to the uh, consistency or congruence of these things. We did an fMRI study, which means that the subjects are lying very still and watching these things on the screen. And uh, I'll just show you the data. There's actually more complications of the design, but for all intents and purposes, you can assume this is the brain activity. And as you can see, at the top, the robot, and the bottom, the human, the real human, these two, the brain activity for these two look a lot similar to each other. And you have a different profile uh, in the form of increased activity in a number of areas for the android. So, um, and especially that happens to be in parietal cortex. There's actually one area that does care about robotic appearance, but um, Mainly, the one that I want to talk about here today is the parietal cortex. This is bilaterally, where you have more response to the android uh, and no difference between the human and the robot, even though the human and the robot differ the most from each other in terms of the stimulus properties. So what's going on here? Have we discovered the brain's android area? It seems to be responding selectively to the androids, right? Let's call the economist. But of course, this isn't possible to have evolved. And what we have instead is that Bakersfield node that I mentioned, right? What's going on here? First, like Emily mentioned, the brain is not simply saying no to robots. 
and it's not saying no to human for, human li uh, non-human motion. Instead, it's more complicated, and the way that we uh, conceptualize this is in the predictive coding framework. When you see, the, your brain is always predicting. Uh, this is just what brains do. And this, this is a um, general framework of, of computational neuroscience that's applicable to any domain. But in this domain, when you see the human and the robot, there's a match between how they appear and how they behave. And in the case of the android, your brain tells you there's a person. And this isn't conscious, by the way. Our subjects in this study, they know that it's a robot. But it looks like a human, and things that look like that generally have a certain type of behavior. So whether you want it or not, whether you know it or not, your brain generates that prediction. And when the behavior comes in, which is in this case this mechanical movement, your brain has to readjust its uh, prediction. And uh, that is the activity that we think we're measuring. So I know I have very little time, so I'll just tell you a little glimpse of what we are doing next. One thing that we're doing is to look at the timing of the brain activity because fMRI is great at locating activity but not very good at timing of the brain activity. But one other reason we want to do this uh, is because with fMRI you're lying still in the scanner, you can't really use these techniques in interaction with robots. Whereas with EEG, which is what we are uh, beginning to do, actually this is a robot, um, Einstein robot that's in our lab right now, and we can measure EEG as the subject is actually in front of the robot. And the goal of this is, of course, going to be to link it eventually to brain-computer interfaces where you can use um, EEG data to control a computer's behavior. And these have been working very well in things like motor control, but not so uh, applied so much to social domains. So our goal is to move towards um, using methods that are um, better usable in human-robot interaction. And of course, I on purpose did not show you uh, appearance and movement uh, in, a, in a graph in a space of possibilities, which we obviously have, so we need to explore a lot more combinations of these things. And generally, the idea of prediction violations. Uh, action perception, we said it's not selective for humans, but yet we are highly sensitive from to deviations from uh, normal form or, or motion. So as these examples show, hybrid things or uh, extreme plastic surgery can all have these uncanny-like effects. So I guess what I'm trying to do is uh, every time that something gets written up about our lab's work, somebody comments online, if it's a forum where people can comment, is my tax dollars being spent on this research on the uncanny valley? What kind of science is this? Well. I'm trying to, I guess, make this uncanny valley something tractable that we can study, that we can link to pretty sane science that we do um, in neuroscience today. And uh, the analogy that I make is to perceptual illusions. And, you know, it looks like this A and B are very different shades of gray, but they're actually the same shade of gray. And the reason your brain is telling you this is much lighter is because it's in the shadow of that object. So, the uncanny valley can sort of be construed as a visual illusion and we can learn from it how the brain constructs a visual scene. And um, I would like to thank our sponsors and my lab and thank you for your attention.